you, you may be seated. Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8, we talked about uh, the sum is of the sum of all that was said prior to that is this great high priest in the heavens um, after the order of Melchizedek. It's important for you to understand the difference between Christ being of the order of Melchizedek and Melchizedek being a type of Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay? Aaron's priesthood was a type of Christ. Right. But Christ was not of the order of Aaron. Right. If Brother Paul here was of the order of Aaron, where does the authority come from? Aaron. The order, right, of Aaron. And that bestows authority upon you. Uh, there's a very big deal. Melchizedek was not a type of Christ. Nowhere can you find it said of that. Christ was of the order of Melchizedek. So that you need to understand that. Otherwise, you get lost in uh, not knowing who Melchizedek was. So we have this great high priest. We have a vision. God envisions this wonderful relationship that He wants to have with His people. He's going to do what is appropriate from His end to obtain that, and He does. So, chapter 9 is going to show us some basic insights into what God did and the power of it. It's also going to show us that the New Covenant was plan A, as was mentioned in Sunday School. The New Covenant was plan A, not plan B when plan A did not work. Right. So, Hebrews chapter 9, Paul continues to speak about this comparison, the principles, New Covenant, Old Covenant, earthly priesthood, heavenly priesthood. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. Okay? Uh, some have had different opinions on what that word worldly means. Uh, Adam Clark, I know, speaks of the word cosmos. The word cosmos, uh, world, uh, also means orderly. It also can mean beautiful. However, the contrast Paul is making is not, uh, he's not bragging on the earthly sanctuary. In chapter 8, verse 2, it says, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. That's the issue. In verse 11 of chapter 9, But Christ, being come high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, or not of this workmanship, or not of this construction. Okay? So that's the point. 9.24 says, For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands. So this worldly sanctuary basically is saying uh, a sanctuary of this world. A, an earthly material sanctuary. Uh, and that's what it had. It was very beautiful. God had it adorned because it was supposed to be an appropriate type of the heavenly. And so He used the most precious things on earth to adorn this so that it would, to some degree, uh, strike the people with the beauty and the awe that it would be appropriate if it was a type of the heavenly. Verse 2, For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary or the holy place. As you can see up here, this is just a, a simple diagram. You had the outer court. You had an opening with curtains. The people could enter and come out of here to bring their sacrifice. The Levites worked in this area, the sacrifice, the, the altar, and the laver. Only the priests went into the temple, the sons of Aaron. Okay, not just any the Levites, but the sons of Aaron. And they would go in here, and as you came in through this veil, you would walk into what is, he says, the sanctuary. The word sanctuary means holy place. You would walk into the holy place. On the right would be the table of showbread. On the left would be the, the candlestick. And here would be the altar of incense. Then you had another veil. And behind that was the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant and the cherubims were. Okay? So he says here, And there was a tabernacle made the first, wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Um, 
I wondered why they mentioned the table and the showbread and don't mention the altar of incense. I don't know if the table there, if he was referring to the altar of incense or not. Um, no way to really know that. Verse 3, And after the second veil, this would be the second veil, okay, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly or in detail. <coughs> now, I believe there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, because he didn't want to take the time it wouldn't, wouldn't serve the purpose for which he is saying this. Number two, he's writing to Hebrews. They had the scriptures. They knew what the scripture said about the order of the Holy of Holies. But number three, only the, only the high priest went in there once a year. The people didn't ever go in and look at the Holy of Holies. Okay? So, uh, in Paul's day, the Holy of Holies did not have the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? The Ark was not in there. The priest would go in there to the Holy of Holies. Uh, and ever, you know, the, the post-Babylonian exile days the priest that was built after that did ha had no ark there was no ark of the covenant in it okay so they would go in here and they would sprinkle the blood and uh, wh where the ark was supposed to be sitting on the floor um, it is believed by the Jews that ne Jeremiah hid the ark in a cave on Mount Nebo uh, before the Babylon Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem some believe that uh, it was taken out of Jerusalem in the days of Manasseh or Athaliah. Um, there's a lot of different theories, but the fact is, the ark, it wasn't there when Titus uh, carried off the temple items. There's an arch in Rome uh, that's the triumph or victory arch for Titus. It shows the Romans carrying the temple items out of the temple. There is a picture of the candlestick, the tables. They got it all engraved in this big stone arch there. And that was their victory arch that they had conquered Judea, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and carried away all the golden artifacts. And so uh, you can see a picture of this candlestick engraven by the Romans on their victory arch there in Rome. Uh, but the Ark of the Covenant was not there. So, that's another reason why they can't speak particularly, because even the high priest in Paul's day had never seen the ark. So, uh, anyhow. <clears throat> Verse 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. This is the first tabernacle, okay, within the courtyard. Um... <clears throat> But into the second with the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying. Now remember, this is a type. Okay? The Holy Ghost, this signifying, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Okay, if, if this whole design was to teach that... Man could not approach God yet. Okay? If that whole design, then that was part of plan A, right? Because this is designed to teach something that would later be changed in the New Covenant when Christ would be our priest through the veil. And we, we could access God through the Holy Spirit, through Christ, which an Israelite man had never been told that he could do that because... God signified by this whole setup that if a man wanted to pray to God, he had to go offer a sacrifice and he, he did not have direct access to God. Uh, the priest had to bring the prayers of Israel, which was the incense, and offer them on the altar before God and so forth. Uh, I don't know how it would be in the mind of a Jewish man in that day because I can't go enter into that. I don't know how they viewed God without any of what we know about Jesus Christ and the Lamb of God and, and, and Calvary. 
I don't know how they would view God if all they had was the the Pentateuch, some of the prophets, Psalms, and uh, Sinai, you know, in the tabernacle, in the priesthood. I'm not sure how a Jewish boy would grow up and how he would view God through all that, uh, because I can't go there. But I'm gonna, we're gonna, by what Paul says here, Paul had been on both sides. So Paul understood some things that it's hard for us to grasp, having never been there. Now, the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. The first tabernacle could not make proper atonement. There could not be the adoption of sons. Uh, the Holy Ghost was showing that men could not freely approach God at this time without the tabernacle service and priesthood. <clears throat> Hebrews 10.19 says this, and this is, a, this is moving on down on Paul's uh, presentation, jumping ahead a little bit. He says in Hebrews 10.19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So let us draw near to God as our personal Father, as our Abba, and let us be able to talk as to God Himself and expect that without the priesthood of the temple, we are actually getting through and we are talking to God. He is hearing us. He is our Father through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We have this boldness. We can draw near and we have confidence that we are heard and accepted and this is not presumption. Okay? Now, like I say, I'm not sure. I know men in the Old Testament cried out to God and prayed in some manner, but they always were supposed to pray towards the temple, as you remember. Daniel prayed towards the temple. And so there was a different mindset in, in their understanding. Um, we don't worry about which direction we're facing. We're not praying towards the temple. But Solomon, when he dedicated the temple, said, if wherever people are, if they will pray towards the temple, then hear thou in heaven. So there was a different idea about approaching God. Um, and, and Paul is saying this to Jews who will soon not have a temple or priesthood. Verse 9. Uh which, talking about the temple or tabernacle, was a figure for the time then present. Okay? This, this temple, this tabernacle, was only a figure, an object lesson for that time, is what he's saying. Um, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now that has always bothered me trying to figure out what he was talking about. The conscience, if you follow that in, in this book particularly, uh, it talks about uh, in verse uh, 1022, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. I think the word evil there would be better guilty conscience okay a guilty conscience let us draw near and and so it tells me that this moral consciousness in the Israelite individual when they were offering sacrifices it seems that they saw this service as a continual appeasement of God's wrath but not as a first John 1 9 if we confess our sins yeah would you check that out if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we are back in full fellowship. I don't know that they had that understanding properly because it seems that they, they lived under a weight of guilt and kept offering the sacrifices and doing the service, but that sense of guilt, that sense of restored fellowship and pardon, uh, was not perfect, was not complete, was not what we have if we believe the Scriptures. And I, like I say, we can't enter into that. Paul could. Paul had been there. We have not been there. But it seems that 
uh, those sacrifices, they did not understand what we understand about the blood of Jesus, the cleansing, the pardon, the justification, all uh, from our perspective. Now, justification by faith was a biblical principle. God had said, uh, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. God had said, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be as wool. Talking nationally to Israel. Um, yet the Apostle Paul, inspired of the Holy Ghost and very acquainted with the situation, in, tells us that what we have in hearts sprinkled from a guilty conscience, we draw near to God with boldness, confidence before the throne of God was not something that the average Jew had before they came to Christ and understood the gospel that we understand. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal or earthly uh, ordinances. It doesn't mean they were carnal in the sense of worldly ungodly, okay? you got to keep these things... Uh, the word carnal here just means uh, with actual flesh and meat and sacrifices. Uh, the word carne has to do with uh, meat. You're, if you're a carnivore, you eat meat, okay? You're carnivorous. But the word carnal can mean that you're obeying your flesh as opposed to the spirit. The word carnal can also mean having to do with the body and the earth and the world and not having to do with the spirit. So these are carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation, the time of the Messiah. But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, not of this construction, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh in a ceremonial sense, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Your moral consciousness, your heart, in other words, I think what he's saying is this. How much more should this give you a challenge morally to break your heart, draw your affections after God with such power as to make you abhor your sin in your own evil ways? The display of God sending His Son, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him, that, that reality was not understood and seen by the people before Christ. But God is, Paul is saying, and God says, that this new covenant, this, this uh, redemption that is coming, is going to have a greater moral challenge, a greater moral effect, to where it should draw men's hearts away, it should break their hearts, it should bring spiritual rebirth and moral rebirth to them. Let me read you Ezekiel 36, 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Then down to verse 31. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Um, this had a uh, historical relevance in the people coming back from Babylon. There would have been a major work done in them that produced this. But this is also pointing forward. Uh, this assumes a willing heart. And... God expected and planned that the offering of His own Son would and should have a greater effect morally, a greater effect on your affections, a greater effect on your trust, a greater effect on men to draw them to God. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. 
that display of God uh, was meant to be a more powerful draw and more productive display than Sinai ever could have been. And those two are contrasted in this very book. Okay? Um, you know, in the parable, Jesus said, He sent the servants. Last of all, He sent His Son, saying, Surely they will reverence My Son. That, that I mean, the idea that this is a greater influence and a greater challenge and should have more effect it seems that Paul is comparing the Gospel's moral challenge. I'm, I'm saying the New Testament, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God sending His Son, it should have, he's comparing the moral challenge to the hearts of men to the moral effect of the Old Covenant law and the service of the tabernacle. There was plenty there to draw men's hearts. There was plenty there to challenge them. But not as great a challenge not as big a challenge. And that's why, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? There's more expected of us morally and spiritually because of what we know. We have seen the Son of God come and give His life and we now we understand John 3.16 is a reality to us if we believe. Um, now, listen to what he says here. And for this cause. Okay? He said here, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience, your moral consciousness, your heart, from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, He, the Lamb of God slain, He is the mediator of the new covenant. Moses never died for those people. The mediator of this covenant is the one who shed his blood to pay for our sins. In Acts 21.20, James says to Paul, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Weren't they before? Well, I'm sure they were to a degree. But now, the degree is greater. Why? Because... That lamb slain has come alive in their hearts and minds in an incredibly powerful way. Can you imagine? Can you imagine going into the temple understanding all the typology and seeing the service of the temple and understanding it from Paul's perspective? <clears throat> okay, for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions, they were under the first covenant. Uh, they which were called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. You might notice if you're reading along that I'm using the word covenant. <coughs> um, the Greek word diatheke is translated covenant 20 times and testament 13 times by the King James translators. It should have always, every single time, been translated covenant. I'm going to prove that to you. I'm going to show you why. We call this the New Testament and the Old Testament. That's not correct. It's a New Covenant and the Old Covenant. A testament, a last will and testament, is what I write out. I want this to be done with what I own. I want so much to go to Titus and all to be divided. And then when I die, that's in effect. Okay? That's not a covenant. In a covenant, you have two parties that are still living. And they make a covenant and they slay a sacrifice, divide the pieces, pass through the pieces, and the slay, the ratifying, the cutting of the covenant, okay, the ratification of the covenant is through a dead animal, a, uh, a sacrificial victim. And that means that there are terms to this covenant. If I break them, it's like, I will. I accept the fate of this animal as my fate if I break the covenant. And that was the idea. We are slaying this animal, and this, this covenant, oftentimes the blood was sprinkled on the people in making the covenant. But they would both pass through. There was different ways of doing it. But the, all covenants in the Old Testament were all made with a covenant victim, a sacrificial victim that was slain, and the blood shed uh, to ratify 
and secure the covenant between two parties who are still alive and still accountable to the covenant. Okay? Big difference between a will, a testament, and a covenant. Now, there are why they why they didn't get consistent on this is a little frustrating, but people can only do with what they have to do with. I wouldn't have known that had I not had people who brought this to light and gave all the evidence of it. Okay? So we got to give them a little slack. But the fact is, covenant is covenant. It's kind of like in the King James Bible, uh, the word Pascha should have always been translated Passover every single time. 26 times it was. One time it was translated Easter. Easter doesn't fit there. Okay? Herod wasn't waiting until after Easter to slay Peter. Now people will say, well, uh, Passover only refers to that one night with the meal. No. The Jews used the term Passover to refer to the whole feast. And Herod was waiting until after the feast. They say, well, Herod was an Idumean. He was a heathen. He wasn't celebrating Passover. Wrong. Herod was a practicing Jew for political reasons, and he was celebrating Passover. Okay? Easter doesn't belong there. Period. Pascha means Passover. Should have been... Uh, Diathek means covenant. Now, let's walk through, because I think the idea that in chapter 15, or verse 15, it says, receive the promise of eternal inheritance, and that I think stumbled him. The idea of inheritance, we usually connect to a will. But this is an eternal inheritance based on the fulfillment of a covenant. Alright? Now, verse 16. I'm going to read what they have here because they're thinking of a testament. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, the one who made the will, obviously the father in the sense of making a will for his sons. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Now, that, that all is true concerning a, a testament. But is that the way the verse should have been translated? Did the, did the apostle, after talking about covenant, 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 all of a sudden digress, and now he's talking about a testament? A testament is in force after the testator is dead. A covenant is in force after the appointed sacrifice is dead. The definition of testament by Webster, a solemn, authentic instrument in writing by which a person declares his will as to the disposal of his estate and the effects after his death. This is otherwise called a will. There's no mediator needed for maintenance, no blood sacrifices, no sprinkling of the parties, no, testi no testator dying to redeem transgressions of a previous testament. The testator doesn't die to redeem transgressions of a previous testament. Okay? A covenant, according to Webster, a writing containing the terms of agreement or contract between parties. Covenants have terms and conditions to be fulfilled. They have mediators who assisted in making of them and are sureties for the performance of them. They are commonly ratified by blood sacrifices, which blood was sprinkled on the parties at times. If any former covenant was infringed by the parties, satisfaction was given at the making of a second covenant. So if the first covenant was broken, we're going to make a new covenant, we've got to make settlement for what happened in the last covenant, which is what it just said about Jesus uh, in verse 15 there. It said, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, that they which are called might receive. So everything has to be accounted for because the covenant... Uh, was not kept and therefore God regarded them not and this new covenant has to cover the transgressions of that old covenant or they're all going to hell now how does a testament fit in this view of the covenant Hebrews 8.8 8. for finding fault with them he saith behold the days come saith the Lord when I will make a new covenant that word covenant is the same word it's all, it's all the same Greek with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them 
out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. I'm not going to die and leave them my estate. Okay? We're going to continue having a relationship based on the covenant. Now, let me give you Young's literal translation of Hebrews 9, 16, and 17. If you look at, go ahead and look at verse 16 and 17. This is Young's literal translation. For where a covenant is, the death of the covenant victim to come in is necessary. For a covenant over dead victims is steadfast, since it is of no force at all when the covenant victim liveth. Let me read you what Adam Clark says. Adam Clark, well, I'm not going to read you everything he says. He says quite a bit on this. He says, A learned and judicious friend furnishes me with the following translation of this and the 17th verse. Now this, I think, I think he did better than Young's even. Verse 16. For where there is a covenant, it is necessary that the death of the appointed victim should be exhibited, because the covenant is confirmed over dead victims, since it is not at all valid while the appointed victim is alive. He observes, this judicious friend of Adam Clark, there is no word signifying testator or men in the original. Uh, the Greek word behind testator is not a substantive, it's not a noun, but a participle or a participial adjective derived from the same root as covenant uh, and must have a substantive understood. I therefore render it the disposed or appointed victim, alluding to the manner of disposing or setting apart the pieces of the victims when they were going to ratify a covenant. And you know well the old custom of ratifying a covenant to which the apostle alludes. So, the word testator is a noun or substantive, as he says, but appointed is a participial adjective and appointed victim is a participial adjective with an understood noun, which is victim. Okay? Appointed is uh, describing the victim. Now, in the Greek, it's not a noun. But testator in, in the King James is a noun. Okay? Now, the word translated testator is also translated appointed by the KJV translators. Luke 22, 29. And I will appoint you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed me. Both of those are verb forms. No, they're not noun forms. Uh, Acts 3.25. It talks about the covenant God made. Okay, made to be appointed. But that's, just, that's the word. Hebrews 8.10. Covenant, God says, I will make. Same word. Uh, Hebrews 10.16. Covenant, I will make. Same word, I will appoint. Now, those are all verb forms. Those are not noun forms. So, let's go on. What is the connection between 15 through 17 and 18 and 19? 18 says, Whereupon, or accordingly, neither the first testament, or I would say covenant, was dedicated without blood. Okay? Seeing that covenants are ratified with a covenant sacrifice, so was the first. Testaments are not dedicated with blood. Covenants are. Now, let's read it together. I'm going to read you Adam Clark's Friends translation, and then we'll go right into verse 18. Okay? For where there is a covenant, it is necessary that the death of the appointed victim should be exhibited. Because a covenant is confirmed over dead things, since it is not at all valid while the appointed victim is alive. Whereupon, neither the first covenant was dedicated without blood, for when Moses had spoken every precept, conditions of the covenant, to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant, not the testament. You don't have the blood of the testament. You have the blood of the covenant, which God hath enjoined unto you. Okay? It fits perfectly. The other one is a derail. You're talking about a will, the death of the testament, and all of a sudden you're talking about Moses 
sprinkling the blood of calves and goats? There's no connection in thought. Clark says this. The word, uh, the Greek word translated covenant answers to the Hebrew word bereth, which all the translators of the Jewish scriptures have understood to signify a covenant. So it should always be translated covenant. Now, when we say New Testament, we are speaking in contrast to the Old Testament, right? But, if the Old Testament was fundamentally a covenant and not a testament, then it is incorrect to speak of testament at all. The word should be translated covenant every time. You can't have a New Testament and an Old Covenant. Okay? Hit one more. Think about this. <clears throat> Clark says this. Very good point. If the law of Moses be a testament, and if, to render that testament valid, the death of the testator must oh, be necessary, as the English translators have taught us, Hebrews 9.16, I asked who it was that made the testament of the law. Yeah. Was it God or Moses? And did either of them die to render it valid? Right. That was the Old Covenant. Was it ever? Okay, if it was the Old Testament, we could say, was it ever a testament at all? Okay. Okay, verse 21. Moreover... He sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law, the covenant, the old covenant, purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. So this is the point made in verse 16 and 17, that in order to have a covenant ratified, you had to have a victim. You had to have a covenant victim slain. This does not fit with the fact that Dad died and we inherited the farm. Okay? That doesn't fit. Um, without the shedding of blood, there is no entrance or continuance in the covenant. The covenant was ratified with the blood of the covenant sacrifice. Verse 23. It was therefore necessary, because of his reasoning, which testament is not included in, only covenant, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, a blood sacrifice. Same idea. We're talking about the fact that a covenant requires a blood sacrifice to ratify it. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. There was only one sacrifice, the blood of which was worthy to place on the altar and sprinkle on the mercy seat of heaven. No other sacrifice had been sprinkled on that mercy seat. Because no other sacrifice was worthy to sprinkle on that mercy seat. There was only one. Once for all. One sacrifice with eternal, infinite merit. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 28, the very night of His death, or His arrest, For this is My blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the truth. Okay? Christ is of the order of Melchizedek. If Melchizedek, if his priesthood hood, was in a tabernacle made with hands, then you have a real uh, short circuit in Paul's reasoning. But if Melchizedek was truly Christ, an appearance of Christ, which it would have to be because he's of that order and there's no one before Christ. And Christ was there. What was Christ doing at that time? Okay, there's so many things that totally destroy this idea that Melchizedek was a Canaanite uh, priest, lived in Jerusalem. Okay, obviously he would have had a place, an altar there. But it was an earthly altar with animal sacrifices. Christ was not of that order. Christ was of... A heavenly order and so if you follow if you can follow logical connection you'll see that Melchizedek had to be Jesus for Christ is not entered in the holy place made with hands which are the figures of the true but in heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others 
For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, or most likely the end of the age, the Jewish economy, the end of that uh, dispensation where the Mosaic Covenant was enforced, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. His sacrifice has eternal infinite merit. It is sufficient to cleanse to the uttermost those who come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession. So, just because Jesus died once for all, it sprinkled the blood once for all, has a once for all sacrifice, doesn't mean I'm once saved, always saved. Right. Okay? In one place it says, in verse chapter 10, he says, uh, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Once saved, always saved, right? Wrong. By one offering, that offering is able to save them to the uttermost that are coming unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession. They shall have to keep coming. Okay? But that one sacrifice is sufficient to sanctify them forever. Also, the word sanctified means set apart. When you're in covenant with Christ, you are sanctified. You are set apart and you are under the blood. If you violate the covenant, you're no longer sanctified. Right. Okay? So, this once, uh, once death, once offering, once sacrifice does not mean once saved, always saved. Uh, as some run with it. Okay, let's go on here. Um, for Christ is not entered in the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world he hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sin of many, and unto them that looked for him. That's a term, a condition. Those who are appropriately waiting for him Shall he appear the second time without sin, without a sin offering, one offering forever, he'll, he'll appear without a sin offering unto salvation. The next time he's coming, he's not coming to offer himself. He's not coming as the lamb. Um, next time he's coming, according to the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Hebrews. What did the Apostle Paul say, briefly, to the Thessalonians? about the second coming. 1 Thessalonians 1 19 or 1 9, I'll just read it. Talking about the effect of Paul's ministry, how ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. Turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and wait for his son from heaven. That was just an understood part of their Christian faith. Uh, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, did this happen in AD 70 as preterists teach? What did uh, the Thessalonians expect to happen? What did they expect to happen? They were waiting for His Son from heaven. What did they expect? Did they expect the Romans destroying Jerusalem would fulfill that? Well, in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, for the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Well, maybe that happened in Judea, we just didn't hear it. Verse 17 then says, Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Can't miss that. Right? And meet to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So, was Timothy a true Christian? Was Timothy a true Christian before 8070? Was he still on the earth after 8070? What happened? 2 Thessalonians 1 7. 
And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of His power, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe. That wasn't talking just about God punishing those bad Jews in Judea. This was after the gospel had been preached over the Roman Empire. And there were a lot of people not obeying the gospel out there too. It's more appropriate to think of something like this after God has given all this time for the gospel to go around the globe. And then Judgment Day is going to come. Let's stand together. Any thoughts or questions? <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9. Obviously, if this was to signify that the way into the holiest was not yet not yet made, okay, the way was not yet made manifest. It was there was not a clear way. And this veil represents the flesh of Jesus. When he died, it was rent from top to bottom. Okay? Uh, some people believe that Jesus' real birthday is April first because that's the day uh, that all this was reared up. And if that represented his flesh, that's a little sketchy. Uh, possible, who knows. But, we know when he died, it was rent from top to bottom. It represented his flesh, and his sacrifice opened the way for men to God. Now, wh what does that mean to us? I haven't seen God. I haven't gone to the Holy of Holies. The, the adoption could be completed. I could become an actual son of God legally. Instead of a servant, I became a son. The Bible makes that plain. So there was, and and I can I can go out here and I can say Abba Father, and I can approach God in a way that evidently a Jewish man didn't feel comfortable with. He could pray towards the temple. We we have examples of prayer, but obviously Paul, having been on both sides, saw that this is different. We can have access with boldness to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit help with our infirmities. We come to Christ who makes intercession for us. And we can come boldly before the throne of God and make our petition. Paul did not think he could do that before, uh, before he knew about Christ or before Christ came. And he's not just speaking of his own experience. He's speaking in, as, as a matter of principle. So, I, we, we, you know, we can't explain all that. The Apostle Paul, if he was here, would say, okay, this is how it was before. This is how it is now. This is the difference. We can't do that exactly. But, the fact that this signified something to come means this, is, this was plan A. What we got now is plan A. Like we said, it's just a, you know, continuing it on out. Yeah, and did God change the order of a lot. He didn't change his demands for holiness and right living. He changed much of the structure of the order in, as pertaining to the legal, the legal principles of our redemption and all that stuff. There was, there was a, that was a huge adjustments going on between the first and uh, covenant, the second covenant. And so our access to God through the tabernacle and taking that channel or our access to God directly, there was a change in the access. It doesn't mean I couldn't have a relationship with God through that and and to rejoice in the Lord and all that stuff, but there was a difference in the access and uh, the legal principles on the other side. If we could see what went on in heaven and how it operates differently because of the changes, it probably would look a lot different to us because there was a lot of spiritual, legal changes going on that maybe you don't readily feel that much different. Mm -hmm. And would have, there would have been a difference. And the difference that he brings up as far as coming to God directly or indirectly, you could say, um, would have been a physical difference that they felt, and that's why it's mentioned. But there's a reason why there was that difference could be made, and you would have seen it in the heavenly. You would have seen that taking place, and why? But we didn't see that part. We just right. have to take it by faith that there was a shift in the access. And, I, and if Paul were here, I would like to ask him to clarify uh, distinctly what he means by couldn't make them perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Uh, how would their conscience be different than mine? And I, the only thing I could think of in looking it all over was that they felt like that these sacrifices kept God appeased. 
but they didn't fully feel that the sins were washed away. But yet the Old Testament talks about it. Mm -hmm. Psalm 51 talks about it. And yet Paul indicates here that they never felt totally cleansed and clear. Like we would if we came... You know, they... Um, he talks about the sacrifices making a remembrance of sins every year. So, which indicates they didn't feel like those sacrifices actually cleansed it completely, but they were confessing the sinfulness and, the, and so forth every year with these sacrifices, keeping God happy. Uh, but yet, when I confess the sin and forsake it, give it to God, ask the blood of Jesus to cleanse it, I don't confess it again. I, don't, I move on. And one of the things God said in the New Covenant was, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So, that was, that was said to be something different than what it was previously. Yeah, and whether it was them talking about them feeling guilty or the principle that they were still guilty. Um, their, their record was not cleansed until Jesus' blood washed it clean. True. So there was, if it whether, they record, felt, whether they walked around with a heavy weight, which doesn't necessarily seem necessary from reading the Psalms, or whether it was just a true principle that the godly man knew, my sins are still on my record until Jesus' blood comes and washes it clean. And so if I, if I knew that I was following God, uh, if you knew God's principles, you would know that the blood of bulls and goats weren't, weren't the end thing. It was a schoolmaster pro, pro, program. Some people trusted in it too much. But you would also know that my record is not clean before God until Christ's blood washes it clean. So whether it was a feeling of guilt or it was just an understanding that I'm still guilty before God until that takes place. Which Maybe would both be a feeling of guilt. Right, but one... I'm not saying that they walked around feeling condemnation. Right. But, um, but there, was, there would be an element of that. Uh, there would be an element of condemnation and fear before God if they knew that things hadn't been totally taken care of. Now, what they knew... You read Psalm 51, it sounds like, you know, wash me and I should be whiter than snow, purge me with hyssop, so on and so forth. Um... We don't, it's, it's hard to understand Paul's exact meaning here. If he could sit down and explain it to us Gentiles who weren't there and didn't, hadn't lived as a Jewish man, hadn't gone to the temple, it would be a wonderful thing. But obviously he is, he is sharing a difference and, and entering boldly, feeling clean, feeling in fellowship. We walk in the light as he's in light. We have fellowship and we're cleansed and forgiven and all this evidently there's some greater aspect of that now than a Jewish man could ever feel well in, in the new covenant he sent the comforter would that not have something to do with it too well the Holy Spirit was testifying and speaking and working in Old Testament people I don't believe but the Bible talks about in the fullness of time he sent forth his son made of a woman made into the law to redeem those who are under the law and because of that, he sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So the, the Abba, Father relates to the adoption being complete. There was some new confidence, new relationship by that understanding, obviously. Greater access, I mean, obviously, a more personal access versus a more distant access, obviously, because of the washing away the sin, there was a legal, we had more of a legal say right but not necessarily an adoption the adoption process being complete we had uh, more legal access uh, more direct access and so that would have affected the relationship and the understanding well. of that should draw out of us more affection trust so forth yeah the people who believe once saved always saved that was the thought I was to say had had previously had if they understood saved is you know they think saved. They don't. They're not. They're not realizing the dangers that are out there. They think you're saved. It's all done. I'm saved now. It's like no, you just got pulled out of the water. You're in a boat. If you don't stay in that boat, it's going to drown you out there again. You're not saved until you get the land. And um, you need. To, and it's like okay, well, fine. I'm going to stay in the boat and do my do whatever you know. But as long as I'm in the boat in church, they think I'm fine. No, the boat isn't church. Water wasn't everything outside of your church. Water was your sin. What we were drowning in was your sin and, and lack of relationship with God and your transgression of God's law. 
And so if you want to pretend you're in the boat and the boat being in the boat is church, but you're transgressing God's law and in sin, no, you jump back out or you're never in. And uh, that's that's drowning again. So you need to view the waters. If you're going to make an analogy like that, you've got to define the water and the rope to get you to the boat and the boat. And those are all principle-based analogy. You, you uh, translate it into principles. And so if you're living... Uh, the principles of the water, you're drowning in it. And so that's something that they get all mixed up about. People use the drowning man and saving him, and he's saved now as a as an analogy, but they're misdefining what that water is and how you did jump back in. No, I'm still in church. No, but you're doing the things. Right. You're in that. You're drowning. It has you. Church is biblical church. Is part of the terms of the covenant. Absolutely. But church is not the covenant. Okay, baptism is not the covenant. It's one of the terms of the covenant. So the covenant is God's expectation, God's arrangement whereby you remain in Christ. And you must live in covenant with God. The only relationship God will have with a human being is within a covenant. The only, when He established the Mosaic covenant, you've got the covenant of circumcision with Abraham, then you get the Mosaic covenant. There was a covenant prior uh, with why Abel and Cain knew they had to offer sacrifice. And Cain didn't do it right. So he was on the outs until he got it right. Okay, So there's God has always had terms and conditions for relationship. The new covenant is the same thing. And we must fulfill the terms of the covenant if we want the salvation of the covenant.